Hello and welcome to Tuesdays with Morrissey, where we share insights from great thinkers. So I'm excited to be joined by Hannah Power, one of the leading experts in the field of personal branding. Hannah is the author of The Power of You and the founder of Amplify, a personal branding membership for individuals looking for the clarity, confidence, and consistency to build a powerful personal brand. Hannah, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Amazing intro. Straight Thank to you. the point, nice and clear. Loved it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. The concept of a personal brand is one that's been around for a while. Mm-hmm. I think I first heard of a personal brand myself in like middle school and high school when they were talking about doing doing the things the right way, for example. But it's definitely changed a lot with mm-hmm. new platforms and ways to express it. What is your present day working definition of a personal brand? I think it's such a good question. I don't think there probably is one definition of a personal brand because I think you can think about your personal brand as your reputation, which could be your online reputation or your offline reputation. So I guess maybe that would be my definition of of a, a kind of an entry level thought of what a personal brand is. It's who are you? What do you want to be known for? How do you want to be known? How are you showing up? But I think that the way that we have approached and adapted personal branding over the last sort of like I would say 10 years is more in this world of building a personal brand online that's obviously the area that I work in and this concept of really clarifying your message your offer what you can bring to the world and turning that into a movement that people can follow and engage with and buy things from potentially and although it feels like we're like far into that journey, I think we're actually really just at the beginning of the power of what personal brands are doing. Because if you think about a personal brand, really, you know, on the internet, everyone is almost the same, right? Because everyone sits behind a screen. So no matter whether you're famous for this or you're doing this, the internet has democratized the kind of content and the kind of people that we follow and, and the way that we consume information. And I think personal branding, the definition in this day and age is really about what are your dreams? Who do you want to be? What is your message for the world? How do you want to, what legacy do you want to leave? And how are you going to go about doing that? And obviously the online world is an amazing way to do that. What was it about this space of personal branding that originally excited you? So I have a like quite a unique upbringing because my parents were very early internet pioneers so they launched the first like online business network in 1998 and I was six years old and they launched it together so it was before LinkedIn it was before Facebook it was before all of those and it was their real pioneers my parents they're really like innovators and they that's the world that we grew up in my, we were very involved in the business we went to their events we all had profiles on their um, site and we just learned very very early on the power of the internet and what individuals were able to do through connecting online, through sharing content and all of these things. And we traveled the world and they were kind of, I guess, like the early, like digital nomad internet entrepreneurs. And so that was really like the world that I knew. Now they had a really up and down entrepreneurial journey. So I was actually very anti all of that stuff. I went like the other way. I was like, I'm going to go into corporate. I'm going to study law. Like I'm just going to go completely into the system and not be in that chaos of all of that world because it's just, yeah, it was lots of, um, my mom calls it castles to caravans. It was lots of ups and downs. Um, but I, after studying law in two and a half years in corporate, my heart lasted a whole two and a half years. I quit and moved to Bali and I was like, right, I'm going to let this entrepreneur out of me. I really like suppressed it I really did like if people said I was entrepreneurial I took that as an insult like I actually thought that was not a good thing to be I really had like some real blockers about entrepreneurship and what that meant and and all of that and when I then got to Bali and I I started my first business and I messed that one up and I started another one I messed that one up because that's just what you do isn't it I like slowed way down and I really kind of started really broad of like what is my purpose what is my why what is what am I what am I really good at what do I love doing what does the world need you know kind of like an Ikage type thing and it just kept coming back to this concept of personal branding because I believe that personal branding really sits on the balance of personal development and like digital marketing and business and those are like my two big passions right like being the best version of myself and then I love business and I love marketing. So 
I ended up there because I knew that it was it would match what I love doing, but also I really felt that there was a need in the world. I felt that the people that were smashing it online were not necessarily the best people. They were just the ones that knew how the game worked. And I felt like if I can work out the game and I can teach that to as many people as I can, mm -hmm. maybe we can fill the world with better leaders, with better voices, with more messages. And yeah, that's kind of what led me to it. Yeah, you have a really wonderful hero's journey if you remember, are you familiar with Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey? Of course. What personal brand coach should I be if I wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> well, for listeners, it's a it's a story framework popularized by Joseph Campbell, who studied all the great myths. And one of the themes is it is at the end of the Hero's Journey, you return home with fresh eyes. So mm -hmm. it's really cool to hear your story about how you developed your own relationship with this concept of personal branding and online entrepreneurship, even though you grew up with it. For sure. And the thing is, I had always reaped the benefits of having a personal brand because posting on social media was so normal to us. There mm -hmm. was no, there was no fear. There was, you know, we just did it. Like that was just what we did. My dad was always very encouraging of us to get our Twitter handles when Twitter came out and all of these things. A lot of my life had actually been shaped by my personal brand. I just didn't really realize that, you know, I had managed to get summer jobs. It had helped me to get, when I did start working at corporate, I was able to network and navigate online because I knew how to do that. When I started my business, I was able to get clients. And I just thought like, this is obvious, right? So often the thing that our, our purpose is, our gift is, our message is, is something that we do so naturally because mm -hmm. we just feel like, because we know it, everyone knows it. And that's actually one of the big things that I work with my clients on early on to try and break out of that and really work out like the things that are obvious to you and come natural to you, like those aren't obvious to everyone else. And that's the value that you can really bring. So it was very like, at first I was like, everyone has a personal brand. Like everyone knows this stuff. Everyone knows how to do this. And this just doesn't feel very, um, I don't know. It just seems obvious to me. And I think that kind of obviousness, that kind of like a little bit of delusion, I guess, was what like led me into it because actually it was quite early back in 2018. I think I was the first official personal brand coach, which helped me get the number one spot on Google because there wasn't really anyone that did it. There were, there are now, there's loads of us, but back then there was no one really doing that. So um, yeah, it was an interesting journey that, that led me there. And I have an interesting passion, I guess, for the internet and social media, love hate relationship, I would say, but much more on the love side now. You bring up a good point. The reality is everyone does have a personal brand, whether they know it or not. And some mm -hmm. of our, some of my recent past guests, there's a couple, Gay and Katie Hendricks talk about this concept of zone of genius. And mm -hmm. it's very similar to the concept you have with flow or mm -hmm. that you think a lot about with flow. And then another guest, um, a guy named Bob Berg, who co-authored a book called The Go-Giver which mm -hmm. sold over a million copies. One of their the key tenets is the most powerful gift you have is you. So I want to talk a little bit about how do you yeah. see the role in authenticity and how do you help people uncover a personal brand? Because the reality is whether they know they have it or not, they do. Yeah, I think everybody has, everybody has a message everybody has the potential to build a brand around something which can change their life and the life of others. Everybody has a story. Everybody has overcome something. Everybody has learned something. Everybody has knowledge. Everybody's worked something out. I think that most people, you know, are content at just carrying on in their lives, right? They don't, well, more and more, I think, are shifting towards doing things a bit differently. But I think everybody has that potential to build that brand and to have that message. And I know that from, from coaching and I've coached like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and really, really wide range from FTSE CEOs to sex therapists, you know, like really broad range, you know, deep kind of technical software engineers to spiritual founders running ayahuasca every weekend, you know, like really wide range. And everybody has got a message in there and actually the concept of like searching for purpose I think can be a really dangerous journey searching for this one thing that you're supposed to do in the world and I think that it's good to have an idea and start thinking about what you're you know to start that journey of find 
accepting that, I think it can kind of kick off the personal development journey. But ultimately, I think your purpose comes from your flow, your flow being the thing that you love, that you are the best at, that you could do all day, um, that challenges you, that stresses you out, but also like you can't live without it. Like that's what I believe your flow is. And everyone's is different. Some people's flow is to be a doctor and I'm watching Grey's Anatomy at the moment and the surgeons on there, right? That's their flow. And for some people's flow, it's to, um, I don't know, teach in a school. You know, everyone's got their their flow. But when we find that and we find that one thing that absolutely sets us on fire, that then usually drives people to then at the birth of like the next phase of their life. And I help to kind of piece pieces together and bring clarity to something which some people for years and years and years and years has been a bit of a muddle. And when you get that moment, like it's magic. It sounds like there's something really powerful that comes from clarity and alignment. Mm. And there's also an element of searching that's natural. And it seems like sometimes these things reveal itself when we let go and stop searching and pay attention Mm -hmm. to what's easy. And that's what you're talking about with flow. Mm. Yeah, it's just that if there's anything that you do where you're like, you're lost in it, you're almost like high on it, you know, like it makes you high because you love it so much. And and often it's really niche. It's something that no one else, like sometimes I'll talk about like, I've just been really in flow and my mum will be like, oh, darling, you're so lucky that you like that because most people hate that. You know, like it's, it's something which is usually very unique to you and it comes from you know, starting with that place of what do I really love? What am I best at? What challenges me? What can I, what could I not live without? But going down it on a much more detailed level, people will say like, oh, I love operations. Oh, I love working with people. Oh, I love, you know, it's too broad. What is the moment, right? What is the present moment of what is it that you're actually doing in the moment where you're like, I'm on fire. I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And the more that you fill your life with that, the more that I think everything else and I've seen and I've seen in myself, the more that everything else does align with it. And the, and that's what to me, that's what flow is. It's about really knowing what that is and filling your life with that thing and then allowing everything else just falls into place around it because that's what you're here to do. This morning, I got an email from you that says, if one more person tells me to niche, I'm going to cry. How do you think about people's need to really niche down or not? And then if they choose to Mm -hmm. not, how do they communicate a brand that might not initially all seem to fit together? So I think the concept of niching is completely accurate, right? I think we all need to have something, a problem that we're solving for a particular audience, right? That's just how the world works. That's how business works. That's how everything works, right? But the problem with the concept of niching is I think it's too much in a box. It's too linear it's like you need to it's too focused on oh I need to niche on this industry or it needs to be specific it needs to be something that's already been done that's the thing with niching is that we're always looking for something which has already been done and we're putting our own spin on it when we start to look at our message and the messaging process is like a four-step process right that's the magnetic messaging process and the niching is looking at the niche is the second part of the process the first part of the process is looking at your why, your vision, your values, your per- your purpose, all of those things. And then we bring in looking at the niche and then we look at the target audience and then we look at communicating it. And the thing is, is that when we look at niching, it, it's too, it's too box focused. So we resist it, right? And we think, oh, I don't want a niche. I don't want to be known for one thing. I'm multi-passionate. I've got all of these things going on. When we look at a message, an umbre- message is more of an umbrella term that goes over everything that you do. But you do need to be known for something, right? If you scatter gun and go everywhere and you're not focused on a particular audience and delivering a particular, you know, core thing that someone can grasp, obviously that's not going to work. So you absolutely do need to niche. But I just think that if you can think about it as creating your own niche, you know, the niche of one, I think some people call it. Like when I started in personal branding, as I said earlier, it was pretty much a made up thing. There was the concept of personal branding, but the concept of a personal brand coach was quite a made up thing. I made up my own framework. I made up my own methodologies. I made up, everything was completely made up because I saw a problem that I wanted to solve. I had a passion for doing that. And I found an audience that needed to have that problem solved. So I think the problem with niching is that it puts our, it limits our creativity. It makes us feel that we have to go in a box when actually if we start at the beginning and we go broad and then by doing that, 
we then find our own space and we create the niche of one, a niche that we can own, then we're excited by it. Most people that are the most resistant to niching that I work with, when they then actually find their niche and find their message, they're the ones that are the most happy with it because they feel like they've had that like clarity moment. Like you said, you know, clarity breeds confidence, breeds consistency, breeds all of these things that we need. So you need to know what you stand for. You need to know what you want to be known for. You need to know who you're serving. But I just think that the concept of the niche, people are so defensive to it. They're so fearful of being stuck in this box forever that they don't want to be in, um, that they end up not making any progress. And we have seconds on the internet to grab the attention of the people that we want to work with and the people that we want to help, the people that we want to serve. And ultimately, you know, it's kind of like a don't hate the player, hate the game situation sometimes where I'm like, unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. You've got to be known for something. We've got to find something. But I usually look at it in a much more abstract way. Chuck everything out. I think of it like a funnel. Chuck everything in there, all your ideas, all your beliefs, all your passions, all your story, and then like bring it down the funnel. Then eventually out pops out the message. And that's something that usually is completely unique to that individual. Yeah. How do you see personal branding changing over time? Because it, it is clear that it is a really powerful thing for people to be able to secure like a position mm. in a space. But I'm curious how you see it changing. I think, I mean, it's changed so much over the last just like five to 10 years. I mean, it's changed a lot even in the last five years. I started working in this space officially in 2018. And when I first started, you know, you didn't need to be that much of a king of content or a queen of content to build your brand. Now, personal branding and content creation are basically the same thing, right? You've got to be like an unreal content creator um, to be able to achieve any of the outcomes that you have with your personal brand. So I think that that is going to increase. I think we're going to see more and more people becoming content creators. I remember earlier this year or late last year, Snoop Dogg joined LinkedIn and it was just like the weirdest thing, right? Because it was like, why would Snoop Dogg need to be on LinkedIn? But you're seeing a lot of people that previously haven't needed to create content to start thinking about all their personal brands, all of these things. I think that's going to, I think that's going to really increase. And then I think what goes up must come down. I think then it will peak. But um, I think for the next 10 years, it's going to be a personal brand game for most people. And I actually think that just like we've seen Trump, like take over the US and he's basically built up his personal brand right through um, all the things that he's done. I think we're going to see that more and more and more. And I think we're going to see, I, it excites me because I see personal branding as a democracy. I think it's more democratic because it's a complete um, meritocracy, right? Either you are good at building your brand, your message is good. It lands with the audience. Like the audience choose, the people choose who is going to go up the rankings in personal branding. We don't have that in the system outside of that. We don't choose the people that run the companies and really we don't choose the people that run the countries, right? We're given like a very small amount of options. It's a, it's a very different world to be able to actually decide who we think should or shouldn't um, be leading the, com the, com the country, the world. And I think we're just going to see more and more power coming to people that have built their brands up. And I think that's scary in some ways, because I think that, um, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, if you know how to play the game, you can achieve a lot of influence. And I think sometimes that is negative. But I also think that with all the all the dark comes all of the light. And I think we see more and more positive leaders coming out of the space. And I really believe that we're going to fix this world individually. I really believe in the power of the individual. I don't believe that big companies and big governments, all of these things are going to be the people that are going to change the world. I think we have to take a stand by changing the way that we act and the way that we um, we wait, we made, we make our money in the way that we do things. So I think it's going to really, really disrupt. I think personal branding has the power to really disrupt the world, like as we know it. And I think that's a really big statement to make, but I also think that it's true because I think we're already seeing it. Yeah, I think we're already seeing it too. I mean, it's fascinating when you talk about democratizing and the people choosing, you know, not too long ago, people were talking about stories on TV shows and they still are to some extent and they're what they see on the five o'clock news. But in a lot of the conversations mm -hmm. like I'm in, it's like, did you see that reel with uh, the, the guy mm -hmm. at the sandwich shop, you know, or whatever it was. And it's interesting because like those people are gaining influence and they're not chosen by a book publisher or a casting director. Yeah. 
it's just chosen by the people. Yeah. And I think that's so much better because like, so I am not someone who like, I don't apply well, for example, for jobs. Like I find it really like back in the day when I used to apply for jobs, like on paper, I never used to be someone that would get through the doors of things. Right. I'm, I, I haven't, um, succeeded in whenever I've tried to do something that's fitting into a box I've never succeeded in that way that's why I always love the concept of personal branding because I was like this is a skill I can get good at if I can solve a problem for a particular audience and I can inspire and motivate and educate and entertain then that's how I'm going to be able to have the best impact and that has and have the most influence and that has really challenged me that has pushed me to be better that's pushed me to overcome ego, limiting beliefs, all of these different things that's pushed me to be better because I haven't had somebody, you know, saying, oh, you're already here. I've had to get, get, and I'm not saying particularly I've got particularly far, but I do intend to, but I've had to get there by doing it myself, by taking each step, by taking each step. And I think that so much of the, the way that our world is run, the way that the VC world operates is it basically gives everyone like this, like leapfrog, like you leapfrog through all the stages, like you leapfrog, you know, you go on Love Island for two months and then you leapfrog to a million followers. And then you suddenly have all of that influence. And we live in this like leapfrog society. And that means that we then don't have the best people that are leading us and influencing us. And if you can push up more and more individuals, you know, the rise of the micro influencer and you can start to dilute some of that attention and that energy going to these few people. I just think it's a much, much better world. So that's why I am so focused on the empowerment of the individual, because I just think that that would be a much better world to live in. The concept of building a brand seems the same in the online world as it is, as it is and was in the offline world. It's just consistency. You know, people got a, mm-hmm. a brand of being a hard worker because they showed up every day and they were the first one in, first one out. It's very, it's very, mm-hmm. very similar. It is, apart from I think that there are those are soft. There are baseline. Are soft there are skills. baseline skills you need to have to have effective yeah. consistency in the digital world. Yeah. And I think that that's what people underestimate. I think people think that content and building a brand is easier than it is. I think that it's a real, like it's to to succeed in this day and age, I think you really need to embrace the fact that if you want to achieve the goals that you have for your personal brand and for your business, you've got to become a marketer. You have got to learn the principles of, Mm -hmm. of marketing, of psychology, of copywriting, of content creation. You've got to learn the, like I am now a really good marketer, but that wasn't what I really intended to do when I started out. That's what I've needed to become to achieve the goals that I have with my personal brands. And I think that those hard skills, those are skills that I, I, you know, I teach my members in Amplify. There's a lot of them and they do take a lot to learn. I think it's harder to be successful now, whilst it's a, it is more democratic, more democratic, more meritocratic for people to be successful. I also think it's harder. Like when I work with consultants or coaches who are kind of 50 plus, they can't believe how hard it is now to get a client compared to how they, what their business was when it first started 20 years ago, because you just didn't have to grind and hustle in the way that we do now. So I think that it's opened the doors, but I also think it forces us all to be better. And if you're not willing to, to embrace that challenge and to embrace the fact that it's going to be challenging, then you're going to fall away. And I think that's what we're going to see in technology more and more. You know, there's going to be some people who are living in this technological utopia. I always say to my family, like, we've got to be on that side, right? We're on the side that's like mastered AI and mastered content and mastered all of these things so that we can be on the good side. But we're going to see people on the other side who didn't want to or chose not to. And personal branding is is widening that gap. You know, some people say to me, oh, but this person in my industry gets all of these, this attention, and I'm better than them. And I'm like, unfortunately, you're to the rest, you're not. To the rest of the world, you're not. It doesn't matter how good you are offline. It doesn't matter that you've got this, this, and this credibility and this qualification and this and this. We live in a world that what you see is what people perceive you as. Perception is everything. And if they're not perceiving you in the way that you want to be perceived, that's on you. That's not actually on them. That's the world that we live in now. So you have to be in it to win it. And I think that um, I think that most people won't be. And I, I say that with sadness. And I also say that to trigger because I want people to be listening to me and be getting pissed off and being like, no, I am going to do it because 
Most people won't. Most people quit. I say that to my members all the time. Most of you guys are going to quit. You're not going to be here at the end of the year. You're not going to be here next year because you're going to find it too hard. You're going to quit and you're not going to have your dreams. You're not going to help those people. You're not going to have that freedom. You're not going to take Thursday afternoons off so you can go and play with your kid. You're not going to do that because you're going to quit. And that's the problem. That's the other side of social media in this personal brand world is that the dopamine, you know, the instant dopamine is making us lazy, affecting our discipline. So you, the consistency that kicked off this question is, although you need it more than ever, you're all, you've also got even more fighting against you. And for me, that's been huge because I'm a massive like ADHD addict, like fast dopamine seeker. I have to, you know, I don't even have any social media on my phone. I have two phones. I have a work phone and a personal phone. On my personal phone, there's no social media. I can't have access to that all day, all times of the day. I, if I start consuming social media, I'll stop creating mm -hmm. on social media. And you've got to be your, your one or the other. Either you use social media or it uses you. And I want as many people as I can to be on the side of being the user of it rather than having being used by it. Yeah, I think a lot about the concept of creators versus consumers. And you're generally mm -hmm. one or the other, and it's hard to be both at the same time. You mentioned mm -hmm. that content creation and personal branding are kind of the same thing. What advice do you give to people who aren't trying to be influencers, but want to create mm -hmm. a personal brand that serves them? Pick a platform, one platform, right? You don't need to be active on every platform, right? Think of each platform like a country, right? They didn't used to be. They used to be like towns in one country. And now they're countries because they're huge. So you don't need to speak every single language. You just need to pick one country and learn to speak that language. Pick the country, pick the platform, which you... Um, enjoy creating that style of content that you feel that your audience are on and a platform that you enjoy spending time on and then and then learn how to create content right just learn the basics of it and then do one post per week at the same time on the same day every single week that's my strategy for a lot of my one-to-one -one clients a lot of my clients are very busy they're founders they're running companies they've got lots going on and um, obviously you can outsource it right there's mm. there's lots of ways you can hire ghostwriters but if you're doing it yourself post one time per week, same time, same platform, and just focus on getting better on that one post. So it's not about being an influencer. It's not about building a big audience. You're not going to get famous from that one post per week, right? You're not going to end up like on the front of the Daily Mail, but you will build your personal brand with that one post a week. I can't believe the results that my clients can get from one post per week, consistently posting one post per week. I had one client he went live, did his Wednesday post, the next week did his Wednesday post. And then that week got two investors, angel investors in his DMs on LinkedIn because he was posting good content and posting once per week. And then when you get to the end of the year, you've got 52 posts, right? You look at the ones that have done the best and you just rejig them and put them out again. You don't have to become some prolific, crazy content creator. You just need to be showing up a little bit, right? It's like, um, going to the gym, not everyone needs to be a bodybuilder, but like you need to find something that you want to do. And one post per week can really, really change your life. You speak a little bit, you talked about how you want to see people living with more clarity and having the agency to make impact in the world. What is your vision for a world where everyone has clarity about the impact they want to make? Well, we exist, I mean, we exist in a very low vibrational society, right? So I don't know if you've ever seen David Hawkins work yeah. where he created this, you have seen it, yeah. Um, and he created this like scale, basically, for those who don't know, it's basically zero to a thousand and it's essentially rate, measures the emotional vibrations. So you've got high vibrational emotions and you've got low vibrational emotions. High vibrational emotions are things like joy, peace, um, happiness, like those are high vibrational emotions. And then we've got low vibrational emotions like fear, apathy, guilt, shame, grief. And as a society, we live in this really like low vibrational state, right? And that has a massive effect on the world that we live in, right? Because like attracts light. And if you know, if you spend time with someone who's low vibration, you end up feeling really rubbish, right? And so a lot of people when they start on their personal development journey have to cut out half of their people that they spend time with, because they're like, I can't be around that energy. And 
I believe that, so what David talks about in his, in his work is that he says that when we move from low vibration to high vibration is when we cross over this, this chasm of courage, right? This chasm of, of bravery. That's what moves us from disempowered victim consciousness mm -hmm. to empowered, um, high vibrational consciousness. And a lot of people building their personal brands have crossed over that, right? They've, they've, they've been through some big adversity or they've got some desire that's pushed them over that courage adversity. And they've gone into this low vibrational space, this high vibrational space even. And getting people to that courage point is, it can be really, really hard, right? Because they're so used to living in this disempowered place and we live in a disempowered society. So when you say, what is my vision for a world of people with clarity, clarity of the impact that they want to have. It's to live in a higher vibrational world because we will be happier, we'll be healthier, we'll be more at peace. We won't be killing each other. We won't be having wars. We won't be having this. Like I live in a really nice part of the UK and like I re rarely leave here. Like everyone's like, you need to get out of Farnham. And I'm like, why? I love it here. Um, and when I go out in the rest of the world, like, I, I'm so empathetic. Like it can make, it makes me really sad. It makes me really sad what humans do to each other. And I have experienced that myself, you know, experienced um, the worst of the evilness of what humans can do to each other. And my vision is just a world with a higher vibrational state so that we don't have to live in the, this world that we live in and this, in this pain and this um, unhappiness that we live in, because, you know, we've got a lot of mental health issues. We've got raising suicide rates. I mean, we're living we've completely lost touch with what humanity is all about, about love, about family, about friendship, about helping each other. And I think that this solopreneur movement, this rise of the individual is really going to take us back to how we once lived. We once lived like that. Like I've got a chicken, you've got a pig. Can I swap you five chickens for a pig? And someone else would say, I've got milk. Do you want to do my taxes? And it would all be this like nice swapping system. And then gradually our system moved into this kind of big government and all of these things. And I, and I do, and I can see why it happened. It makes sense, but I just, I don't think that it's worked. I don't think that it's working. And my vision is a world of the more empowered people that we have, the less disempowered people that we have and empowered people empower other people. And you become a light and an example for others. So my mission with Amplify and with everything that I do is to increase as many people as I can up that scale into that high vibrational state so that we can live in the world that God did create for us and not in this world, because this makes no sense. I mean, what would the aliens think? They would be like, how is it like this? I mean, it makes no sense to me. Um, and I think it's really sad. And I don't want my children to grow up in a world that's quite as challenging as this one is. So that's my like impact is to raise individually through one person at a time. At the moment, it's pretty much one person at a time. So yeah. Beautiful. There's so many things come to mind. I had a, a conversation with one time I, I met one of the big technocrats of the age and I asked him if he thought we could use technology to reduce human fear and suffering. And his comment was people love being afraid. So yeah. there's a, there's a, you talk about the people there's, we need to have individually a willingness to shift out of victimhood and into empowerment and cross the chasm. Mm -hmm. Another friend I was just talking to the other day was saying, a big element of success is the willingness to be misunderstood. And when you're just yeah. doing anything, just getting started, it takes a lot of courage. And I love what you're doing because I do think it has, uh, it happens at an individual level. Have you ever heard the story of the young man throwing seashells back in the sea? Yes, it rings a bell. So the story but is, I can't remember um, exactly that. Yeah, there are all these beach seashell um, starfish. Excuse me. Uh, there was all these yeah. beach starfish on a beach, and a young man was throwing these starfish um, back in the sea to save them. And I, I, somebody comes up to him and says, "Hey, what are you doing? You're never going to make any difference." And he picks up one of the starfish, throws it back in the sea, and says, "I made a difference with that one." Mm -hmm. So thank you for what you're doing to make impact on individual starfish yeah i really like that and i think that if we if we all thought like that we'd be done do you know what i mean if we all focused on on one but we're so focused on huge that's the thing everything is so about huge you know it's about huge startups and vc or it's about huge this everything is about huge and again i can see why we've got there and huge is 
alluring when you're building stuff. Like it's nice to think big. And I think you do need to have vision. You know, I have a vision of a million members, right? It's taken me about 30 years, but that's my vision. But um, I think we, we're so obsessed with fast and huge. And then we get there and we're like, what am I going to do? And I'm going to have to go do another huge thing. And we're just like running around in circles. And yeah, I just think, I don't know. I think I've just, I've been on a journey in my 32 years, which I think is a, a lot for a 32 year old to have, have been on. I think I've like had had certain situations that I've been in, ex- things out of my control. And then I have put myself into situations. Now in hindsight, I've realized I put myself in them, which have forced me to ask a lot of questions and understand a lot of things. And um, thank you for that, like that compliment and for that story. Cause I just, I, that's, that's really what I, what I live by. And um I like that you see that as because sometimes I think like maybe that's not enough, but actually at the moment that's all I can do. So at the moment that's enough. Yeah, there's so much we could talk about and probably should have a follow on conversation around the personal branding and society because it's something I think a lot about. But in the meantime, thank you so much for mm-hmm. coming on the show. What's the best way for listeners to keep up with you and the work you're doing at Amplify? Um, the best way would be either on LinkedIn or on Instagram. So both are Hannah I power, or if you want to join the Amplify waitlist, you can go to Amplify you like the, you, the, just the letter dot IO, and then you can join when we're next doing a, an open. Awesome. Well, we'll have links to both those in the show notes and thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Tuesday's Morning See That conversation was with Hannah Power. Hannah is one of the leading experts in the field of personal branding. What I enjoyed about the episode was Hannah's view on how clarity on your personal brand can unlock competence and practical actionable tips for people, whether they're trying to be an influencer or not. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend and we're here. see you here soon. Thanks.